Well, good morning and welcome everybody to the No Fly Zone. I'm Stephen Wood. I'm the director of the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law in the University of British Columbia. We in inaugurated the No Fly Zone virtual lecture series uh, as a um, effort to bring together uh, knowledge and stories about lawyers and legal knowledge holders around the world who are using law to pursue environmental justice without incurring the carbon emissions that would be associated with air travel to bring people together. Um, and that was before the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic made a necessity out of virtue, so to speak, as the online interaction on virtual platforms became the new normal. Um, the No Fly Zone lecture series uh, has had um, two um, events already this fall, and I'll just mention them briefly. Um, on October 1st, we were joined by American human rights lawyer Stephen Donziger from New York City uh, to discuss the epic environmental litigation of Chevron and Ecuador, Lessons from the Front Lines. On October 29th, we were joined by leading Canadian animal lawyers, Victoria Schroff and Camille Labchuk, to discuss accessing justice for animals. And the recordings of those uh, virtual lectures are available on the Center for Law and the Environment website, which you can find just by Googling Allard Center for Law and the Environment, uh, or going to the, um, uh, the webpage that you used to register for this webinar. Today, we are joined by Lindsay Kigata Burroughs, uh, who is going to talk about laws are for the lawless, learning Indigenous law on and from the land. I want to, uh, by way of introduction, say a few things about where I am. So I'm speaking to you from my home, which is indicated by the little blue house icon on this Google Maps satellite image. And the blue briefcase far at the far left marks where I would normally be working, the law school at the University of British Columbia. My home, as you can see by the blue dot, is more or less in the geographic center of the modern city of Vancouver, a metropolis that sprang up in the blink of a historical eye like mushrooms after a rain, with more than two other, two, sorry, with more than two million other settlers. I'm an uninvited yet persistent pest, excuse me, guest on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam. Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations. For millennia, these nations have maintained vibrant, sophisticated, and prosperous societies on this land in dynamic relation with all of its beings, human and non-human, animate and inanimate. And you can get only a very limited sense of these nations' relationships to and presence on the land in these images that I've just showed. But how how much the land and society have been transformed by colonial settlement. Canadians pride themselves as being a society with the rule of law. Indeed, we're ruled by more laws than we can count, an ever thickening web of laws that seek to bind people, just as the ever thickening matrix of roads, pipelines and buildings, concrete, metal and plastic, bind the land under this city, hiding, or transforming it, not just in the satellite imagery I showed you, but even on, at the ground level uh, when you simply observe what's around you. So how can we learn anything from the land if we can't even see or feel it? But of course, that's not a question that Canadians are taught to ask, is it? We live in a society where we expect the land to learn from us or to break. It yields to our yoke or, and answers to our dictates. But today's speaker will suggest that there's another way to relate to land. And I first had the joy of meeting Lindsay Burroughs in 2016 in the fall at her beautiful home community of Neoshenigming uh, on the Georgian Bay side of Lake Huron uh, in the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe when I attended the annual 
Anishinaabe law camp, uh, or I should say one of the many annual Anishinaabe law camps run by Lindsay and her father, John Burroughs. And I must say, I learned more about law in that one weekend than in years uh, of previous legal study. And I was so deeply impressed by Lindsay's leadership, her wisdom, her incredible knack for knowing and remembering people's names and making them feel heard and listened to. And I was deeply grateful for the generosity of Lindsay and John and elders of the community in sharing with us some of the laws and learnings that this community has drawn from the land. So Lindsay Burroughs, Kigata, is a citizen of the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation. She's currently pursuing graduate studies uh, in law. Previously, she was a lawyer and a researcher at the Indigenous uh, Law Research Unit, the ILRU, at the University of Victoria Faculty of Law. She's also worked as a lawyer with West Coast Environmental Law, primarily on the RELAW, Revitalizing Indigenous Laws for Land, Air and Water project. She supports Indigenous communities to revitalize their traditional laws for application in a contemporary 21st century context. And she's worked with many legal traditions uh, and indeed lived uh, on and visited the territories of many Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, Hailtsuk, Maori, Mi'kmaq, Nuchanuf, Statink, Deneje, and Silkotin. Each fall, as I mentioned, she returns to her home community of Neishinigming in Ontario for several weeks to co-teach land-based Anishinaabe law camps. I do wonder what has happened with those in the current circumstances. She recently published a book, well, which I didn't get handy, but you can see it in front of me now. She recently published this wonderful, remarkable book, which she refers to in her bio as creative nonfiction, uh, but which I refer to as a um, treasure trove of law and wisdom called Otter's Journey Through Indigenous Language and Law from UBC Press in 2018. After Lindsay speaks to us, there will be time for question and answer. Um, and to do the question and answer, we're going to use the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, you should be able to find the Q&A button uh, at, in your Zoom controls, usually at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we're not going to use the chat function for that, so please don't use the chat function because uh, we can't really easily manage and monitor both. Um, you can pose questions in the Q&A. You can also upvote other people's questions in the Q&A. Um, we will start to take questions after Lindsay is done, and the way we'll do it to make a more interactive experience is um, that when we select a uh, question that we'd like to pose to Lindsay, we will actually invite um, the questioner to unmute yourself, introduce yourself briefly, and pose the question live to Lindsay, unless you indicate that you'd rather not do that. Um, and we are recording this uh, lecture. It will be available for um, viewing uh, on our website. So with that, I will welcome Lindsay uh, and uh, just express our gratitude uh, for joining us today to share some of your knowledge and thoughts. So thank you very much and welcome. Well, miigwech. Thank you, Professor Wood, for that wonderful introduction and um, situating us more in this place that we find ourselves in virtually together today. Um, I'm grateful for the organizing work of Veronica as well and just wanted to briefly mention too Silver Donald Cameron who um, has played a role in establishing this um, seminar series, the, the late Silver Donald Cameron. And he was such an encouraging person. And uh, I think he would be very happy in spirit looking down upon us today, carrying these conversations forward, meeting in community safely, 
and um, thinking through ideas of how we can be better, better people to one another and to the places that we live as well. Um, so uh, I'd like to begin by introducing myself in the Anishinaabe language. So Bojo Nindinue Magoni Dog, Nija Anishinaabe, Nij Bamadasig, Bangia Tago Ninita Anishinaabem, Nidashko Jitonji Anishinaabe Moyan, Nigik in Dodem, Kigatha and Dago Anishinaabe Mong, and Lindsay Nindishnakaj Aganashi Mong, Neashi Winigaming Nindonjaba. Uh, so in my introduction, brief introduction here in the Anishinaabe language, which is called Anishinaabe Muin, I began by acknowledging everyone who's gathered here as relations. Um, I, I like this practice of thinking through the connections that we have with one another. And I always remember when I was working for the Helsuk First Nation on the central coast of BC, Pauline Waterfall, one of their elders saying, we have more in common than we have differences. And I really like that starting place that we're all gathered here with so much in common as, a, as humans having this um, experience on this planet, this, this beautiful planet that's also full of challenge. And uh, I introduced myself as being a member of the Otter Clan and uh, I'm from Neashinigming, as Professor Wood mentioned earlier, the Chippewas of Nawash First Nation is uh, the formal name of my community. And uh, Neashinigming refers to um, a point of land where it's easy to portage across. Uh, so the community where my family lives now on the shores of Georgian Bay has always been a gathering place, um, a place of, of home, of refuge, of finding meaning in life and in the world. And um, I wish that I could invite everyone to come there and that we could sit around and actually be out on the land and engaging in activities and stories with one another. Um, but it's also beautiful to be able to do this in some way virtually as well. Um, let's see, so I have a few pictures to kind of invite us into a sense of being in place with one another. And I'll be showing them on and off. I won't keep the slideshow on the whole time, but I'm going to share my screen now and um, bring this up for us. Great. So here you see we have a picture of an escarpment. And this escarpment is part of the Niagara Escarpment on the, the Saugeen Bruce Peninsula uh, where my family lives. I took this particular photo from my grandparents' home and looking out uh, towards the escarpment, you can see there's one structure that's visible amidst the trees close to the shoreline. Um, and my grandmother, uh, Jean Jones uh, Boros, she grew up just to the right of that. And she is one of seven siblings, and they lived in a one-bedroom little cabin that my great-grandfather, Josh Jones, built. And they all shared a bed. My grandma has stories of them sleeping under bearskin rugs. And she has stories of going up into these woods that you see here to collect firewood. Uh, to snare rabbits, to hunt deer, to um, hunt for different edible birds. She would spend days out on the water fishing. Um, she used to be able to row all around the, the peninsula in a day, she says. Um, she was very strong and the people in her family who lived there uh, had to utilize everything that the land here offered because the closest town 
uh, at that time and is still the closest town is Wyerton, Ontario, which if people are familiar with the region, Wyerton uh, is about two and a half to three hours north of Toronto. And um, this bay here that you see, Georgian Bay, this used to freeze over when my grandma was young. It hasn't done that in the time of my life um, because of warming trends, the bay no longer freezes. But my grandma has stories of being able to walk from this forested area that we see to an island um, that's just in the bay over here, maybe about a 10 kilometer walk. And she, then they would be able to gather um, or, or just enjoy, there wasn't much gathering in the winter, but enjoy their time uh, out on that island and they would engage in ice fishing as well. So um, I so love the, the stories of this place from former times, but also the living stories of today as well. And I had the opportunity in the summer of 2012, before I went to law school, to work for the Indigenous Law Research Unit at the University of Victoria. Uh, and as was mentioned, I've, I've recently been working for them as well and just stopped a couple months ago to pursue a master's of law. Um, but the goal of the Indigenous Law Research Unit is to partner with different interested First Nations who are working towards revitalizing specific elements of their legal traditions. So the summer when I was living at Neashinigming, uh, working for Ilru, we were working on a project that asked the question, how do communities deal with harms within their community and that happen between communities? So this was, again, before I went to law school. And, um, you know, I think we all grow, I believe we all grow up learning law but we don't always know that we're learning law and we don't have critical reflective practices necessarily of what it is that we're doing or engaging in. And um, that summer I began to articulate for the first time sort of what I believe law is uh, through the different teachers that I had in my community and also through the academics like Val Napoleon, Hadley Friedland, uh, my father, John Boros, uh, Rebecca Johnson, all these people who I was working with on this project. And they relied a lot on the work of um, Lon Fuller, for example, who believed that uh, law is a practice. Law is present anywhere we need to make decisions, we need to create safety, we need to maintain some sense of community harmony. Um, it's present in the ways we make and we maintain relationships. So all of these ways of explaining this kind of big sort of out there term law suddenly brought it home and made me think about these, these very shores that you see in this picture. And thinking back to being on the sandy beach with my grandma and witnessing uh, two kids throwing sand at one another. And my dad was there as well. And um, the, so my dad, my grandma and I all watching these kids throwing sand at each other very playfully. And my grandma said, we need to go tell them not to do that. They're gonna get sand in one another's eyes and it's really gonna hurt them. And my dad said, oh, no, no, like we, like let's not interfere with them, they're kids. They can just learn what's going to, what consequences are gonna happen because of this. And my grandma said, nope. And she went up there and um, stepped forward and told the children, if you do this, you're gonna get sand in one another's eyes and someone's gonna get hurt and someone's gonna start crying and this isn't gonna be a fun activity anymore. And I remember, although being very young, thinking through both perspectives and thinking, yeah, I think what my dad senses has a lot of value. Um, my grandma's sense also has a lot of value. 
And um, for my grandmother, because she knew specifically who those children were, and for her, it wasn't just who their parents were, it was who their great grandparents were and their great great grandparents and who their cousins were. And she had this whole web of relationships that tied her to these children. And because of that connection to them, she felt an extra sense of importance in needing to step forward and care for them um, by verbally letting them know what these actions might do. So such a small example that you know, could be so every day. And I think we all have these moments in our life where, where we're witnessing um, a potential conflict about to arise. And the different pathways into resolving that conflict are so colored by our own worldviews, our own stories, and our sense of, of what might be right. And even as individuals, those sensibilities are continually changing as we learn new stories or the stories that we've worked with for a long time suddenly gain um, complexity or further nuance as we sit with them longer and longer. Um, so um, with, with that kind of introduction, as, as I was working for ILRU this summer, I suddenly began to see these stories come alive and thinking through what are Anishinaabe specific laws of how we um, handle harm within our communities. And my colleague Hannah Askew, who um, is now the executive director of the Sierra Club chapter of British Columbia, um, she was with me during the summer of 2012 and we were going around visiting with lots of elders, um, placing ourselves within an interpretive community to talk with people and find out how is it that we're uniquely creating law and living law in our, in our particular Anishinaabe community. And uh, we went to the senior center on our reserve uh, and met with Carlene Nipate Benesikwe Elliott who has since passed away. And um, as we were meeting with Carlene, we learned that she loves water. And uh, we were on a boil at water advisory during that summer period. And it was very challenging to um, just make sure that we constantly had clean water to drink, for cleaning, for bathing. Um, and we had been taking lots of trips to a well about a 40 minute drive from the reserve and then coming back with big bottles and distributing to them to different elders in the community and just families in need. And um, in response, the, the band office, our band council, which is our Indian Act elected governance structure, they decided to pass a bylaw um, relating to the water treatment facilities and ensuring that we had more training, that there was more funding set aside for it, uh, that there were different kind of technical actions that could take place in order to get us off of this boil water advisory. So on, as Hannah and I were visiting with Carlene, we told her very excitedly guess what? The band council has passed this bylaw about the water. And Carlene just dropped in her countenance and her body just sort of slumped over. And I remember feeling like, oh no, I feel like I'm about to be in trouble here or the band council is about to be in trouble. And she said that laws are for the lawless. And when Hannah and I heard this at first, we didn't really know what she meant, but through our conversations and further time spent together, she drew out some very powerful teachings for us about her view of law. And she felt that the moment a law had to be written down in something like a bylaw, it meant that those laws weren't written on our hearts. They weren't in the most important places that law can live that helps us to actually act in the world in a way that protects 
the very thing that's in harm. So in this case, water. And she shared with us about when she was growing up, she would engage in water ceremonies um, with other women. And they would go to the water and they had particular songs that they were um, given from the water that they would sing to the water. And in doing that, it would, of course, um, have, it had a spiritual element of connecting with those different spirits who live in Georgian Bay. Uh, and then also it had an educational role as well as people knew that these women were going down there and performing these ceremonies and what they were performing them for. And um, there are many water walkers today um, who are carrying on this tradition. And for the Anishinaabe water walkers, um, these walks are being performed in different parts of our traditional territory, but also um, some, there's been some walks where women have essentially gone, like Jos the late Josephine Mondaman, have gone from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic to the Gulf of Mexico. They've really been spreading themselves across Turtle Island, recognizing how everything is connected. And um, Carleen, through the legal resources of ceremony and song, and being immersed in place and in water and through stories. Uh, these were the ways that she really felt that water could best be um, taken care of and learned from. And um, she told us different stories that she learned as a child that taught her about the importance of these different beings. And I hope, well, I do, I do plan today that we'll have some time to um, share some of these stories together and um, ones that I have permission to share to give you a sense of what does it mean to learn law through story and uh, how can we reason by way of analogy to, to apply those teachings to our life. And in Canadian law school, which I know a number of you um, here today are currently in, uh, we have this case briefing method where you look at cases from judges and you ask questions of these cases, like what's the main issue here? Um, how would I articulate what the, the human challenges that's taking place in this story. And then you ask yourself, what are the main facts that are coming forward from this story? And uh, what decision is being made? And like, what was the judge's conclusion and why did the judge decide what they did? And then, um, often we have these external questions that arise from these cases too that become very rich if we can dive into them and, and think through these um, maybe obiter pieces of these cases. So we're very used to using this method within the Canadian common law um, and Ilru through the leadership of Val Napoleon and Hadley Friedland have been doing this work with Indigenous people's own stories. So instead of thinking through um, maybe like a contemporary situation where someone has um, allegedly taken a car from someone else without their consent and it would be labeled as theft and there would be this way to tell the story in Canadian law. Well, in Anishinaabe law, we have Nana Bojo stories, who is our trickster. And Nana Bojo is very known for getting into all sorts of trouble. Um, he's a very good, um, I, I think he, he'd be seen as a criminal quite a lot if we were, if we were using Canadian legal terminology. And um, I think that he really represents one, at least one side that we all have within us. My great grandpa Josh used to always say, we're all Swiss cheese, pretty good, but full of holes. 
And uh, of course, none of us are perfect. And, and so Nana Bojo's trickster-like qualities kind of amplify these streams that many of us have within us that get us into these problems in the world. Uh, so uh, that's some of the stories we have in Anishinaabe law. Um, but then through some of the other work that I've been able to do across Turtle Island, as well as in New Zealand, is learn from Raven and the, the Raven stories of, of the coast, or to learn from Shataya Kai of the Northern Yukon and this traveler character who went through the world um, making things how they are today. There's stories of different uh, animals who lived in a time when animals would talk to each other in a way that humans could understand and lots of transformation happened. So um, these stories are legal resources that we can look to and draw from. Uh, and so this was the introduction of how law functions that I went into law school with. And my first week of law school at the University of Toronto was probably one of the times that I've cried the most in my whole life. I felt like I didn't understand anything that was being spoken. And when I did understand something, it felt really sad. Like I remember in our first week, Eddie Greenspan, this, this big lawyer coming in, and talking during our ethics presentation about a case he had done on arguing whether or not particular pajamas for children were flammable or inflammable and kind of like the loopholes that he found for liability around flammability of, of children's clothes and thinking, why would you wanna find a loophole in the definition of whether children's clothes were flammable or not, or not, and therefore like pr give them greater opportunity to be harmed. So it was this strange kind of cultural shift around thinking through what do we do with our stories and with our words. And, um, and so that became a very challenging year and really felt like I was just hanging on by a thread trying to, to gain a sense of these laws that were coming from these textbooks and often the readings were so they were just so many of them that you couldn't possibly keep up and so every class felt like you're just kind of drowning trying to keep up with the materials so anyways i could go on about this experience but i decided to leave um u of t and try out the university of victoria and so I began my second year feeling optimistic and turns out the law is still the same in, on Vancouver Island. Um, and felt I just need to, to go somewhere else and um, connect again with kind of a, a sense of law that felt like it was making me a better person or felt like a more nourishing environment for engagement. And I say this all now with quite a lot of, um, I just have so much respect for the difficult job that it is to create legal education. And I think that schools are doing lots of really good things. So it's not meant to be a full, a full critique of schools, simply just um, sharing my experience of, of my challenge in engaging with the Canadian common law after being invited into this world of indigenous law, specifically Anishinaabe law. So um, I went to Mexico to get into um, some sunshine, uh, met my friend down there, and shortly after arriving, we got in a bus accident and we flipped off the road and rolled and I fractured my back and my pelvis and was concussed and had severe lesions from where the window went into my leg. And when I came in, when I came to in the hospital in Cancun, I remember thinking, huh, 
I'd rather be here than sitting in a class at school and felt like very validated in my decision to, to step out and find different ways of learning. And um, then I believe it was shortly, not too long after that, that um, I went to an Anishinaabe law camp where I met Professor Wood, as he said, and these Anishinaabe law camps have been hosted since 2014. 2015, I believe, in um, my community of Neoshunigming, and they've been held in other communities now since then through law schools. And um, we do this, this work of what, what I had just explained we were doing with um, Ilru, where we take students out and we have teachings about rocks. Uh, we have teachings about fire. So there is a sacred fire that begins the camp and it runs all throughout the camp. It never gets extinguished. And it's in one of the teepees outside of close to where all the students will be camping or sleeping. And that becomes a place where people can go throughout the whole four days together and talk with the different fire keepers and um, sit with the fire and just in those quiet spaces of either individual contemplation or connecting with the other people in there, thinking through what is it that you're learning and what's happening in your life. And often we don't step back and, and reflect and think through and synthesize um, the deeper levels of what it is that, that we're working through. And we can see this as law, if we view law as something that helps us create safety, maintain relationships, work towards harmony, make decisions or, or solve challenges that arrive. You know, we can do this on an individual level as well as on this interpersonal level and larger group level. Um, so we do that with the fire teachings with water. Um, we, we would teach a water song and we would go down to the water and sing and offer a sema or tobacco to the water. Um, we spent time swimming together, canoeing, um, just being next to the water and, and telling stories of the water. So those kinds of embodied connections were able to come forward and, and teach people. Uh, we also thought about plants. I love the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is an Anishinaabe ecologist. She wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass. And um, she's been talking a lot about Akinoma Gawin. And um, my dad, John Boros, writes about this as well. But our verb to teach in Anishinaabe is Akinoma Gay. Aki is our word for earth. And nomage is to point towards. So literally teaching is that which points towards the earth. So there's this idea that the, the natural world around us is a place we can go to find answers. And Basil Johnston has described, who is a, the late Basil Johnston, he's an Anish, Anishinaabe elder, has described the land as our casebook. And um, there's also a term that's common in Western circles called biomimicry. So there's biomimicry practices happening in architecture, in medicine, in um, material invention. And it's this idea that you can mimic nature in order to help you. So a famous example might be uh, there was this man who observed burrs and how burrs catch to your clothes and he invented velcro because of his observations um, looking at that plant or currently right now in medicine um, there's a group of scientists who are looking to mosquitoes to develop uh, a more friendly needle and this idea that the mosquito can kind of enter into your skin without you almost detecting it. And it's not till the blood's already been drawn that you suddenly slap yourself. Um, so there's many of these examples that are, are happening uh, in the world where we can be looking to the land around us and, and really 
fascinated by the ways that indigenous people are doing this all the time with their laws. And I think that in the Canadian legal world, um, we have really been missing out by not using the lands on which we live as resources for drawing information and um, implementing decision-making structures. And, and um, I'm, this is what I'm working on for my graduate studies right now is, is really asking how, how is, how are land-based pedagogies contributing to the revitalization of Indigenous law? And I'm interested in exploring eventually more about how do specific plants like strawberries or maple trees or sweet grass or bare root teach us about how we can be um, making good decisions uh, in our communities and applying them to real life challenges. Like in, in my community here, um, this one image that you see, we have, there's been proposals to develop a deep geological repository, which is essentially digging really deep into the earth and then burying nuclear waste in there because the Bruce nuclear power plant, which operates on our traditional territories, has developed all of this waste. And of course, not just them, but by the people who are using those services on the peninsula and they have to do something with it. And our community has said, no, that is absolutely not going to be buried on our reserve. But no matter where you bury it, it's still going to be on our traditional territory. And so we need to be involved in that decision making. And Bruce Nuclear has been really, I would actually say quite incredible in terms of the engagement um, and, and listening, but it's a hard decision. And you think these stories of ours and these legal resources, the ceremonies, the songs, the dreams, uh, the land, the, the songs, can they answer such a contemporary question of science like a deep geological repository? And I would argue, yes, they can form part of the answer. They're not going to be all of it because we do need to have um, some of those technical scientific uh, ways of approaching into this, but th these are going to form an equally important angle and lens into figuring out how we can deal with these types of problems. So I wanted to show you a picture here. This is um, some of the students from Osgood a couple years ago gathered for one of our Anishinaabe law camps where we work through these types of contemporary questions we're facing by um, drawing from these different legal resources. And then I would like to stop my share for a moment um, and tell you a story for five minutes um, before opening up for conversation. So this story um, is what helped me, one of the things that helped me eventually get, go back to law school. And uh, I explained about those challenges and while everyone's journey is unique, I don't think anyone's journey is free from challenge. And this particular story is called Mandamin. Uh, I've learned it from three different sources that are all related. Um, they all come from my community. One is Verna Patronella Johnson, who published a, a book of stories called Tales of Nokomis. Nokomis meaning grandmother. Verna is my great great aunt's daughter. So whatever kind of cousin that makes her. And then Basil Johnston, who I mentioned, who also is from my community, he published this book, in, this story in his book, Ojibwe Heritage. And then my dad, John Boros, published a version of this story in his book, Canada's Indigenous Constitution. So those are three places where it's found um, publicly available, and they're each a little bit different. And I love this about Anishinaabe stories is that they remain constant in theme, but ever changing in detail and how they can teach you. Um, so with that, I'll tell you this story.
uh, which is about a young woman and her grandmother. And this young woman and her grandmother were best friends. And um, from when she was a very young age, they would spend all day together um, playing outside in the water. Uh, she learned how to pick different medicines from her grandmother and snare rabbits and um, go fishing. And the two of them, from about when this, this little girl was born until she was about 10 years old, just spent ev time every day together having these um, familial experiences and, and learning about the world. And when this um, girl uh, became a teenager, she, her grandmother fell ill. And so she was going to visit her grandmother and uh, every day checking in and, and sharing time as best she could with her. And then eventually it became clear that her grandmother wasn't going to recover. And she pulled this young woman uh, to her bedside one day and said to her granddaughter, I just want you to know that there are people in this world who are going to challenge you. And they're going to shake your confidence in yourself and make you believe that you are not worth it and that you can't do it uh, and that you'll just need to give up. But I want you to know that you do have the strength to get through it. And um, that really stuck with the young woman and, and she left her grandmother that day reflecting on it and uh, then received word shortly after that her grandmother had passed. And she went into a very deep mourning and really missed her and the seasons went by and everything would remind her of her grandmother. And um, it felt like in many ways her grandmother was still there as all of these words and, and time spent together would come back to her as she went about her daily activities. And um, about a year after the grandmother's passing, a stranger came to her community and um, he introduced himself as Mundaman and he met with some of the, the leaders of the community and said, I'm here with a purpose. I want to find out if there's any goodness in this community. Um, I've, he was saying he's really struggled going around the world feeling like it was just hopeless that everywhere was just full of incivility and lies and um, greed and pride. And he was searching to find an alternate way of living. And so he had heard about these Anishinaabe and that in their language, the, the, the very name for themselves, Anishinaabe means a good being. Nishin is good and Nabe is a, is a, is a man. And so he said, I want you to show me and, and apprentice me to someone here and, and convince me otherwise that this world has not gone to hell. And so the community leaders got together and thought, what about that young woman? Maybe she could be the one to show uh, this young man, this man that in fact, there is goodness here and that he doesn't have to be so down on himself and the world. And so they approach her and she agrees that she can share some of these teachings from her grandma with him. And it begins to be a beautiful experience where she feels so much meaning and, and joy in being able to reflect back on her grandmother's teachings and invite this stranger into a sense. And he seemed so sincere and was really listening. And so she shows him and spends time with him every day and, and a week passes and then another week and she begins to think, I wonder if he's being convinced. He seems to really listen but isn't reflecting back. And so she asks him one day, is there any goodness that you're seeing? Or are you feeling like you're being lifted up and shown that there's another way of living in the world? And he says to her, well, I'm not seeing any courage. I, I'm seeing other things that I think are good, but you're really just missing out on courage. And I've heard you say that this is one of your seven grandparent teachings that's supposed to guide you. Uh, and so she says, oh, well, sure, I can show you courage. 
And he says, well, I want you to fight with me then because battle is a place of really having to show courage. And she felt quite uncomfortable with this and remembered experiences of her own grandmother and um, <sighs> telling her to, av to avoid violence at all costs. And he says, well, if you don't do this, then I'm, I'm traveling on to my next place to see if I can find a, a truly good, um, a good place to be. And so with this challenge, she thinks, well, maybe this is my step of courage. And so the two of them begin to engage um, in this fist fight. And uh, the story goes that she responded to his weaknesses. And um, eventually, after this, this kind of time together in this confrontation, um, Mandaman ends up very hurt. And he dies. And the woman, this young girl is just devastated. And she goes and talks to this medicine woman who tells her she has to plant the, the Mondaman's body and go to it and tend it every day. And so she does this and every day for, for, this, for those seasons that followed, she mourned and her tears fell and, and, and drenched the ground where Mondaman was buried. And then she noticed a little plant sprout up. I thought that's strange. So we talked to the medicine woman, and the medicine woman said, "Just keep doing what you're doing." And eventually, um, I'll show you. Eventually, she noticed that where she had planted Mandaman's body, there were these tall stalks that had grown up, um, and Mandaman himself had been very tall and slender and was dressed in green. And she felt like this plant kind of looked like him. And she peeled back the leaves of the plant and saw these beautiful jeweled kernels inside. And she brought it running to the medicine woman who said, because of your courage and your goodness, uh, you have brought Mandamin, the food of wonder, into our people's lives. And um, corn has been a sacred staple in our diet um, for a very long time, as well as other uh, indigenous people's diet. But this is our particular story of how corn came to be. And um, I love that story for many reasons, but I'll just end by saying, I think it really helped me to think, to not shy away from challenge. Um, <laughs> In so, it's a complicated story because we might be quite judgmental of the girl. She killed him. And what of that violence? And what of the violence that we engage in unintentionally in our life, um, but through our care and attention and commitment to goodness, is it possible to transform those weaknesses into something that is actually quite wonderful? And uh, I think there is, and I think a real story that's important to hold on to in our work with climate justice and environmental health and um, the intersectional nature of this work, thinking through the importance of anti-racism and uh, uplifting one another as humans uh, is that small things done consistently over time can make a great difference. And I think it's the great lie of capitalism to suggest that we have to do everything quickly and that the crisis is here and we need to respond. But in fact, maybe stepping back and sitting in the water or going to take a rest and have a dream is the best step that we could take forward in that moment. And it's us to, up to us to figure out what that might be. So Chimi Gwech, um, thank you. And so we have a few minutes for questions. Indeed we do. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Um, we can take questions um, uh, through the Q&A function, uh, which you find in your Zoom controls toward the bottom of your screen. Um, Please don't use the chat function for that purpose. Uh, we'd just like to be able to monitor one spot and that'll be the Q&A. Um, there's a comment in the Q&A from Kluani Adamek uh, saying, thank you, holding my hands up to you and all of you who are pressing for change through our legal worldview. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
that comment and that support, Kalani. Um, and there, so um, there are ah, there are questions coming. What I'm going to do, as I said at the beginning, is invite um, people to pose their questions live if they feel comfortable with that. Um, Veronica, the coordinator of the Center for Law and Environment will help by inviting people to unmute themselves. Um, and that would be Laura Beaudry, uh, who has a question for uh, Lindsay. And as soon as you're able to unmute your mic, why don't you go ahead, introduce yourself briefly and pose your question. Um, hi, I'm Laura. I'm Métis and Cree from Northern Alberta. I am a second year student and um, just have this question about, you said that you struggled in 1L learning this colonial law structure after coming from learning on the land. Um, how do you think professors can integrate learning on the land in the colonial law teaching structure and is that even possible? <laughs> That's such a good question and I'm so interested in it and of course right now during the pandemic as well it's like a whole other challenge into doing this work. So I'm going to speak to what I've seen happen in non-pandemic times. Um, but I think that, uh, so the University of Victoria has just established a joint Indigenous law common law degree program, the JD, JID. And part of the first year curriculum is um, in torts law. It's being taught by Sarah Morales, who's grounded in Coast Salish law. And so she is using Coast Salish stories to introduce students to concepts of what kind of duties do we owe to one another? And um, what does a neighborly duty in Coast Salish law look like? And for, for her, um, she's written about this in the Windsor yearbook, Access to Justice thing, but she, um, in Coast Salish law, ancestors, are on the land. So mountains, there's stories about how particular mountains used to be ancestors. There's stories about how certain islands used to be ancestors. And because UVic is located on Coast Salish territories, she has the ability to take students out into these places and actually talk to them about tort law um, by thinking through stories of those ancestors and different interactions that they got into. Uh, that draw upon principles connected to torts law. So that's unique in the sense that she is Coast Salish, teaching on Coast Salish territory. But what can someone who's non-Indigenous do, who's teaching, let's say, criminal law um, in, in a place where they have no connection to uh, the Indigenous laws of, of that particular place? And in that sense, I think that's where it becomes really important to um, draw forward and make space within your curriculum to have at least readings from people who are writing about Indigenous law or think about using videos. Um, there's some really good short video clips through West Coast Environmental Law and their RELAW program, which stands for Revitalizing Indigenous Law for Land, Air and Water. That I would encourage people to check out. And also Ilru has some learning videos. So I think a really kind of low hanging fruit way to at least bring it in a little bit is to think through what is publicly available and, and um, published that you can draw on in your discipline uh, to invite students into those kinds of ideas or, or invite a guest lecture to come. Thank you so much for that question, Laura. Um, so there, uh, Natalie Oman had posed a question in the Q and A. I also noticed that Condessa, Condessa Strain, had raised your hand. I'm not sure if you have a question, but I would say that in order to finish more or less not too far over time, why don't we take those two questions, the one from Natalie first, and then Condessa, if you do have a question, uh, and then uh, we'll probably need to wrap up. So if, uh, if um, Veronica can help um, unmute Natalie. Hi there, that's my cat. <laughs> 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 Hi, Lindsay Miigwech. Uh, 
I have a quick question, which maybe isn't really quick, and but I'll ask it anyway. So you've you introduced the final story that you told by talking about how perhaps the one of the strengths of the variations among the ways in which this particular Anishinaabe story has been transmitted um, uh, is that it, it allows the story to always be relevant to the problems of. Oh, you went on mute. The problems of. That, no, it was me. Um, <laughs> so Lindsay introduced the story that she told at the end of her presentation by saying that there are three different forms that have been shared publicly of the story that are thematically the same, but that have different, di they're different in the details and that this can be understood as a strength because it can allow the story's relevance to different situations to become clearer at different times. That's not the only, that's just a very brief and probably inadequate summary. But one of the things that that is sometimes regarded as problematic when we think of the way in which Indigenous legal resources have been used historically in Canadian state courts in the form of oral histories is that problems have been raised about uh, variations among versions of oral histories and because that's regarded within the Canadian legal system, within the ways in which that's typically been framed as um, suggesting that the, the legal resource is not reliable if it lacks complete consistency. Now, the job of Indigenous legal traditions is not to make themselves comprehensible to Canadian common law practitioners. I mean, the job of Indigenous, the revitalization of Indigenous legal traditions is to re revitalize Indigenous legal traditions. But because there's another secondary purpose, which is to um, help to advance the case of Indigenous rights and the recognition of the ongoing presence and, and authority of Indigenous peoples on the land in Canada, it does matter that this um, failure of understanding on the parts of the dominant Canadian state legal tradition exists. So I just wondered if Lindsay wanted to comment on that extremely briefly. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that is such a good point. I'm so glad that you brought that forward for us to think through, at least in a preliminary way together. Um, but I think that one of the one of the ways that it might be easier for Canadian law to deal with the differences and complexity of stories and how they can transform over time um, is in thinking about who is the interpretive community within that Indigenous legal tradition that is telling the story in the moment and where does their authority stem from. So I think Canadian law is quite good, is that the word, is, is very attuned towards concepts of power and authority. And so in oral testimony in court, for example, if it's like a litigation thing that's at stake here, is that that witness is going to need to be um, built up as a particular source of authority. And, and if they are seen and they convince the court enough that they are in fact someone who has a particular amount of knowledge and they're sharing that story, then perhaps they can give weight to it. But then let's say someone else from the community gives testimony next who also is authoritative and gives a slightly different version. I would just hope, like, I don't understand why we can't see that there's value in different ways of, of sharing a story and in fact that's kind of what lawyers are doing all the time is bringing forward the same incident but then different sides are shedding light on different parts of the story and make it sound actually quite different and um we're never going to be able to know 
like 100% factual accuracy. And I just, I wrote about this in my book, Otter's Journey, but I love the quote from the visual documentary filmmaker, Werner Herzog, who's German. And he got under a lot of um, critique for his work because people were saying, well, that wasn't 100% factual. And he said, well, if that's all we cared about in society, then the best book in all of literature would be the Manhattan phone book because every single entry in there would be like correct and connected to a particular fact, but it doesn't tell me anything about what John Smith dreams at night. And I, I really like this idea of um, we have to be okay with, with nuance and complexity in our decision making and I know that there's also importance to, to getting to the truth as much as we can, but philosophically, I think we can be better grounded in understanding the complexity that truth actually presents. So just some thoughts. Wow, so much in that, though. So much more that could be said. Um, we have, uh, we will make time, shall I say, for one uh, last question from Condessa Strain. So if uh, we can help um, Condessa to unmute herself, Condessa, then introduce yourself and uh, ask your question. Hi, uh, thanks for making time for me. Uh, I'm, I'm Condessa, I'm Coast Salish, and I'm, uh, I'm also on Tier Salish, Shikwem Mokun Silks. Um, and I guess, you know, like you're talking about learning on the land and to me when I am reading it and I'm looking at it, it's, it's, it's part of like a very complex process of, of, of it's natural, it's, it's dynamic, it's unstructured, it's a slow process of understanding indigenous law from that context. And I, and, and I think it's really important that like understanding it means that you have to be on the land, that you can't really get the full flavor of indigenous law without that experience, without that time spent on the land. Um, and I wonder, when, you know, when we're looking at Ilru, mm -hmm. um, you know, like how much do we lose when we're putting indigenous story and law through this kind of colonized process? And, and what might you say to people who, who, who might be critical uh, and say that, you know, the, the process of like kind of case briefing indigenous stories is, is actually not gonna fully translate indigenous law through that process. Yeah, such a good point. And I think what I would say to someone who is critiquing it is like, I would just wanna celebrate those critiques as much as possible because I think we really need to be critical of indigenous legal methodologies so that we don't fall into these traps of thinking this is the one way to do it. And the reality is we are gonna miss out on a lot if we're not being broad in our approaches and if we're not being specific enough in our approaches too. So this idea that the case briefing methodology, which is colonial in its origins in some ways, although you could also argue that of course people have been talking through their stories rigorously for many years. But um, I think that if we're only to use that one way of, of being, we're going to, um, we're gonna be replicating something that we probably shouldn't be replicating. And also, I think that we really need to be, um, I'm really interested in urban, like urban indigenous um, communities too, and thinking through the land-based work and say, thinking like, well, what does it mean if, say, a Cree person has been living in Edmonton their whole life and has never been learning on the land out in their community? Does that make them less Cree? Does that make them less able to live their laws? So I'm really interested in the critiques of like land-based learning and those pedagogies into Indigenous law as well and um, just really opening ourselves to them and um, once we can apprehend all of the limitations in these different ways of engaging then I think we'll come out stronger but I also love Val Napoleon's um, encouragement which is that we don't want to freeze ourselves into inaction 
because of these critiques and that not doing anything at all is, is also not a solution. So while we are working with imperfect solutions, um, that, that action often seems to be the better choice than sitting back and doing nothing. Thank you so much for that, Lindsay. So many questions, so many opportunities, so many insights, so many challenges. Um, we have to stop here though. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for spending some time with us, for sharing uh, with us, not only today in this talk, but whoops, in your book. Uh, by the way, the reference to Werner Herzog is on page XII in the premise, pre preface, if anyone wants to find it. Um, and uh, just thank you so much for everything you're doing. And uh, uh, if we were all in a room together, you could hear us applauding, but uh, it'd probably just be my microphone that you're hearing right now. So thank you so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.